everyone, this is Tyler Dallas from the FW de Clark Foundation, and you're listening to the Constitution at Work podcast, the series for people interested in constitutional matters and transformation in South Africa. Today, we are continuing our discussion on the much contested expropriation bill by, unpa by unpacking the ideological background that led to this bill's drafting with Terence Corrigan, project manager at the Institute of Race Relations and chairperson of the FW de Clark Foundation, Dave Stewart. Thank you both for joining joining us this morning. And with that, let's jump straight into the conversation. So last, um, Terence, you and the IRR have been very vocal against this bill and its threat to property rights in South Africa. Just last weekend, you spoke to a gathering of farmers in KwaZulu-Natal on this bill. What were the main concerns the IRR highlighted to this group? Look, I think that um, going back to the beginning, South Africa needs new expropriation legislation. I think that's been uh, that that issue has been been circulating for over a decade now. Um, I think when the the, the first uh, the first bill in the chain of events was tabled in two thousand and seven, if I'm not mistaken. Now we don't we don't we don't contest that. The problem is that uh, there's Trojan horse measures and measures at play here. The most significant one for me is that it, um, it alters the definition of expropriation. Uh, now, this is sort of difficult for a, for a, for a lay person to grasp because the um, way in which, a, uh, in which a property holder would engage with us to say, well, you know, if, 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 if the state is going to take my stuff, then they must pay me for it. And that seems, you know, uh, a, a well and good. And the bill doesn't uh, uh, doesn't say no to that, but what it does say is that uh, is that in order for um, for something for, for an act of deprivation, I think that's the key issue, to count as expropriation, the uh, the rights in the property have to be taken from one from one party and passed on to another. Where um, the state argues that it hasn't actually done that, uh, the property holder loses, but the property rights kind of magically vanish. Now, the, the, word, the word here is custodianship. And for those who don't, who don't uh, uh, recognize this, this is essentially what happened with, with water rights and with mineral rights. And the legal or constitutional reasoning behind the definition was set out in a, um, in a constitutional court case involving AgriSA, I think it was 2013, which um, uh, which related to um, uh, to mineral rights on uh, that that uh, um, uh, that a company had lost and was trying, or um, I think an individual had lost, and was and was trying to uh, trying to claim com compensation for. Now the ju the judgment, which was written by um, uh, uh, Justice Mokheng Mokheng, said, or whatever, com and I think this is these exact words, whatever um, expropriation may mean. So it's kind of vague on what it is, but it when 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 the state becomes the custodian for the people of South Africa, that's not expropriation. This, particularly in the question of land, and um, I do think it's it's germane to say that uh, the danger to property rights is not limited to land. In fact, I think this is more a wedge issue than anything. But land would be a, would be a sort of natural area for this to um, uh, for, for for this kind of custodial drive to aim at. In fact, there have been a number of of um, officials and um, uh, members of the ruling party who have put this forward as a solution. The uh, 2017 land audit, for instance, said that you know the state <coughs> should take over land as custodian of the people of South Africa, which means that no one would then. Be able to own to own land. The EFF, uh, that's their um, uh, that's their their um, uh, starting point for all um, for all discussion. So while the passage of this law itself doesn't necessarily change anyone's um, uh, anyone's rights instantly, it does set up the legal framework where they could be a bridge very rapidly and very fundamentally. Thank you, Terence. And I think that exactly as you say, the state custodianship of land speaks to the ANC's focus on the nationalization of land, which we've already seen with um, mineral resources, but as well with agriculture or what, what we're starting to see. So I think, Dave, can you speak to the ANC's national democratic, democratic revolution? What was the short term, long term focus of this plan in terms of land specifically? Well, you know, you have to 
look at the intention behind the legislation. And I think that intention is locked up in the ANC's National Democratic Revolution ideology. Because right from the beginning, racial redistribution of property has been a central facet of the ANC's approach. Uh, I think in their 2002 strategy and tactics documents, they say that the central task in the current period is the eradication of the socioeconomic legacy of apartheid. And this will remain for many years to come. And the, the distribution of land is an essential part of that. The ANC divided the post-1996, the 1994 per, uh, period into two phases. The first phase was what they called the political transition. And that ended more or less in 2012. And after the political transformation, the second phase was the economic transformation of South Africa. And it is in this phase that the ANC plans to redress all of these distortions that were created uh, in the past. And it, it was summed up best by, by President Zuma, who now described this process as radical economic transformation. And that means, according to him, a fundamental change in the structure, systems, institutions, and patterns of ownership management and control of the economy in favor of all South Africans, especially the poor, the majority of whom are African and male. So that is the background, that's the ideological background to the expropriation bill. There's actually no need for this if one is simply interested in land reform, which is a requirement in section 25 of the constitution. There's more than enough land. The average age of commercial farmers is 62. There are plenty of, of farms on the market, but as the ANC's own high level panel uh, pointed out a couple of years ago, the problem wasn't with section 25. The problem was with the mismanagement by the government departments involved and as a result of corruption. Terence, I want to draw alert to a tweet that was posted by the ANC MP Fayez uh, Jacobs. I hope I'm saying that right. Apologies if I'm not. Um, the tweet read, now after the, the bill was passed, that we are able to take back land from those who have previously benefited. It then goes on to say, it's a big victory for land justice in our country. We can now return the land to our people. Now that word, our people, it's a political rhetoric that's often used. And I wonder if you could comment on that in light of um, not only ANC ideology behind the bill, but also uh, a point that you correctly ra raised about how this political rhetoric of our people creates this reasonable belief and how that links to the unlawful entry on premises bills, reasonable belief defense. Right. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that, that, that you raised that. I remember noting that back in, back in the 1990s, um, uh, President Mbeki was quite, was quite fond of, uh, fond of using that. And that is a, um, it's a, it's, it's a term that I think is designed to, 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 to divide. Um, to say, well, if there's an our people, there must be a their people, and our and loyalties are therefore so, are, are, are therefore split. And I, um, I must say that I'm deeply uncomfortable with uh, the government, uh, the uh, the government or the governing party of a constitutional democracy seeing things in these terms. There's all sorts of implications for senses of belonging and who qualifies for citizenship and that sort of thing. Um, um, what um, what you're seeing with Mr. Uh, uh, with Mr. Jacobs, uh, I think, in a sense, lets the cat out of the bag. That this is not seen as a sort of rational um, uh, rational policy move to uh, bring the um, the expropriation bill into line with with um, uh, with the constitution. And I think it also it, it also shows a, a distressing um, lack of appreciation uh, of, for the realities of land reform. Um, if you want, if, if if you want a land reform program to succeed, as with any program, but you know you've got to understand the the, the trade offs involved. You've got to understand the need to bring um, uh, to bring diverse stakeholders. 
And people say that there's been no, there's been no land reform in South Africa. Well, actually, there has. It's just been very unsuccessful. Um, you know, and uh, well, do you want, do you want, do you want to carry on down this rabbit hole, or do you want to actually, um, uh, actually achieve something better? Um, the blind focus on land, and particularly within, within this, this, this um, uh, context of us and them, which, as I say, is 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 very much the the, the textbook definition of populism. Populism is not about being popular; it's about the people, you know, against you know some sort of external irreconcilable enemy. Um, yeah, uh, it, this this. This this makes for um, uh, for a distressing type of zero sum uh, zero sum uh, 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 politics, and it does nothing to promote to promote rational um, uh, 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 rational land reform. Obta ob obtaining land is actually is actually the comparatively easy part of it, but I think also something to 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 point out there because something similar was made. Uh, some, uh, a somewhat similar point was made by by Minister Lil. Now she's not ANC, but uh, you know, close enough within the current configuration. At the end of her intervention um, in in the parliamentary debate, she gave a rousing "the land is ours." And um, well, who is this "ours" and how are our people represented? Because it's official state policy in in, in redistribution matters that beneficiaries do not get ownership. So it's not like they like like our people are going to are, are going to be receiving anything. They may have some sort of conditional right to 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 live and work it to the uh, satisfaction of particular particular bureaucrats. But it's not uh, the the idea that they that 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 uh, they will obtain property is still, as far as I can tell, not on the agenda. And just staying with this, our people, and as you correctly say, there must be a converse, their people then. Um, it mm. seems to be a widely held, although incorrect notion that the bill would only impact people who benefited through deliberate apartheid policy. In other words, white South Africans who currently own land. Is this the case or should all South Africans be worried, Dave? Well, I think uh, all South Africans should be worried because the re the simple reality is there are no successful economies without property rights. Uh, property rights is the basis not only for economic growth, but also for freedom. There are very few countries in the world that that uh, don't uh, respect property rights that remain free for long. So it is something that affects all South Africans and will affect all South Africans. And I think one has to return to this, to the ideological roots again. You know, the, the ANC's shining city on the hill is not a classless society like the SACP and so forth. It is called the National Democratic Society. And in the National Democratic Society, you have a mixed uh, system of private ownership and state ownership in tension with one another. But the important thing in the National Democratic Society, the defining factor is that everything is distributed according to demography. That if you belong to a population group that has 5% of the population, then you get 5% of everything. You get 5% of the land, 5% of the companies, 5% of the jobs in the public service, and this is a central point of belief in the whole ANC ideology. And of course, it also helps those who want to enrich themselves because this means there's going to be a great deal of distribution uh, of jobs and benefits, not only in the public sector, but in the private sector. And that's why this is not something that will affect only land ownership. The goal is demographic ownership of all of the economy. That's why we have to see this within the same context, for example, as the, um, the Employment Equity Amendment Bill, which now gives the Minister of Labor the right to dictate to companies regarding the racial structure at every level of their organization. So yes, this will affect terribly and detrimentally all South Africans. 
And alarmingly, of course, this is what has most of civil society and individuals up in arm is the nil compensation clause of the bill. It allows uh, expropriation without compensation, as Dave says, not only of land, but of all types of property, of immovable property, such as shares, investments. Um, but it allows it for a public purpose or public interest. Now, looking at the ANC's ideological and political purposes, what would public interest mean? What, what does the IRR think a public interest would be? Could it be land reform in and of itself? Yeah, okay. Um, uh, the, the, just let me, just let me split, uh, split two issues. The, the null compensation clauses seem to be particularly geared towards, towards land. Now, they, they're very problematic in themselves because it says, for instance, <laughs> Uh, uh, land can be can, can be expropriated at null compensation. Um, the ANC, for instance, is not I love the word null. The ANC is paying null compensation to its employees, apparently. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, it, it for instance says that 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 if if a property owner has has failed to exercise control or lost control, you can um, uh, you can have your, uh, uh, your your property expropriated at null compensation now. Um, with I, 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 I have some experience in, in, in urban governance issues and abandoned buildings are a, are a massive problem. Now, there would perhaps be, I think, a justification that could be made that, you know, the, the owner has absconded or whatever, or then um, that, that may be justifiable. But think, for instance, what happens in the case of a land invasion. Uh, these are not taken with particular... Um, is not taken particularly seriously by um, by the state, and I think you mentioned the uh, the uh, pending trespass uh, trespass bill, um, uh, entry of of of, um, of property um, un unlawfully. Well, you know, if you um, uh, perhaps uh, a plausible defence is that um, you know I believe I have some sort of ancestral claim on this, um, and uh, the police didn't uh, uh, didn't uh, didn't come to 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 enforce anything. Now put down some roots, and uh, the government, you know, might not even particularly approve of that, but they're stuck with a political hot potato. You know, do they um, uh, do they act in a way that uh, uh, gives gives some of their some of their opponents, or, you know, uh, ammunition to say, well, those are our people, you know, it's that our and their people, and you want you you don't want to act against them, but you know, you also have the situation where you have a very uh, aggrieved landholder who's still trying to retain position. So maybe you cut the Gordian knot by simply saying, well, you know, he's lost control of it. Let's, um, uh, let's, 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 um, let's expropriate it. Null compensation, um, easy solution problem solved. Um, that, I don't, you know, I don't think that that's, that's, uh, uh, that's beyond the realms of possibility. Now, as for other assets, like they, you know, you, um, uh, the most obvious thing I could see would be, um, uh, would be savings pools pensions, um, uh, medical aid funds. You see, um, the, 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 there's been a great deal of kind of squabbling um, amongst, uh, amongst groups whose interests would seem to be aligned. You know, everyone's sort of pointing, pointing fingers like naughty school children saying, no, 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 go after him, Rob. Um, you know, I've had, um, I've had uh, uh, Real estate uh, mogul saying, "Well, no, no, but this is all about farms." Um, I actually had one um, uh, had one journalist who came to speak to me who told me that uh, that the explicit instruction had been to put a happy spin on the story. That ah, this is all politics, and um, you know, I said, "Well, you got to do what you got to do, but uh, you know, let's uh, you know, you can buy me a falafel when we are uh, when we are refugees in Syria together." Um, so yeah, you know. Um, I, I don't I don't think land is uh, uh, land for an economy like like South Africa is really that valuable. It's certainly not something. It's certainly not not a not a make or break issue for you know for for people with with, with big ambitions. But uh, uh, country rapidly running out of money. I say look at um, look at the how many trillions trillions of rands uh, uh, are sitting in pension funds. You talk about the national health insurance. Well, uh, you know, you've got the the, um, uh, the savings funds of of, uh, of pensions, and one official actually said said to Parliament that these must be nationalised and used to capacitate the 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 uh, the NHI. Now, since those private medical aids, I think, will pretty much cease to exist if this is brought in, 
I don't, I don't, I don't see you know what other uh, what other destination that 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 money is going to have. Certainly not within not within the framework of official thinking. And uh, you know, as 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 Dave correctly said, the um, the idea that you can you can break you can break South, South Africa's economy into these sort of own affairs categories. Um, yeah, uh, that there there is an enormous um, there is an enormous attraction to that. It's, you know, and it's 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 a very attractive um, attractive solution to people with a statist outlook because it's something you can put in a spreadsheet. Well, you know, there's like you know, seventy five percent of this particular magisterial district is owned by you know white people, and we need to make sure that we get an Indian guy in there so we can you know give three percent. You know that that's 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 doable. Um, that is that is something that, uh, that 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 a that a bureaucratic mindset would be quite well suited to. Um, it's much difficult, much more difficult to make um, uh, to make this uh, to to make this work. Um, I mean, I I I'd, I'm not I'm not aware of any substantive polling that shows that there is a huge demand for 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 agricultural land. And this is, uh, comes from speaking to officials at the Department of Land Affairs. So, they, you know, I was once told that, you know, there were these foreign aid workers who had these ideas for kibbutzes and whatever. And so, look, at the end of the day, most South Africans are looking for jobs in towns that pay wages. Um, that's where they see. That's where they see modernity. That's where they where, where, uh, uh, where they see a future. But um, the challenge for for uh, for that sort of agrarian land reform. Things like how do you improve the standards of living of farm workers? Um, how do you ensure that 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 the, that the agricultural economy is viable? That's things like infrastructure, and for those um, uh, uh, for those for those uh, black people who have been denied um, entry into that or do not have the means, how do you make make that 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 transition possible? We put ideas on the table. I mean, if we simply stop bailing out SAA, you, know, you probably have more money than you need. <laughs> But once again, um, this is the the the, the uh, obsession with, with 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 state ownership comes from comes from very much the same um, uh, the same the same background. Um, and incidentally, for those who you know who think that um, uh, you know EWC would uh, you know transfer land to our people or whomever, I encourage everyone to go back and watch the debate when this was um, uh, when, when when this was debated in Parliament. Minister Quinty, who was the land affairs minister at the time, made it very clear: title deeds are not on the table here. So, Dave, what are your thoughts on what Terence has raised, specifically in light of the? I think I think it was an IRR survey on what people would desire more: expropriation without compensation, or, or um, as you say, the creation of wealth and jobs and a, a stable mm -hmm. economy that they can uh, participate in. Well, I, I think it goes back really to the question that you asked earlier, and that is, what is the national interest? Because Section 25 says that you can expropriate land in the national interest, and the national interest includes land reform. That's fine. But is it for the government of the day to determine national interest? If that were the case, the government could come along and decide anything was in the national interest. Surely the national interest must be rooted in the values in the constitution in section one and the preamble and there is no way that you can say when you analyze history and when you analyze economies around the world that the destruction of property rights is in the national interest you cannot say that the the enormous inter-community antagonism that would be created by expropriation without compensation would be in the national interest. So I think we need to define more closely what is meant by the national interest. And obviously we need land reform, but what we forget in this process is that 9 million South African households own their own home. We're not talking about shacks, we're talking about bricks and mortar. And the value of those homes is somewhere between 1.5, 2 trillion rand. Now that's worth much more 
two or three times the value of all of the agricultural and the land in the country put together. What we need to be doing is to unlock the value in that land by issuing title deeds to all of those homeowners. It would be a, an economic revolution in the country. What we need to be doing is to take the 5% of the half, the half of all of the highly productive land in the country, which is in the old black homelands. We must give that land to the people who are farming it so that they can become productive, just as a start. We've got to work with the agricultural sector on a meaningful process of land reform, but a process of land reform that ends up with beneficiaries owning land, and which does not end up with the destruction of our agricultural sector's ability to feed the people. Now, these are all basic common sense requirements. And unfortunately, nothing in the current approach has anything to do with common sense. <laughs> You're quite correct. Let me, let me just, 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 just pick up something and, 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 and run with it there. There is a, a remarkable, how can I put this, uh, naivete that, that, um, uh, that's associated, that, that, that a lot of good, decent um, uh, uh, people, people events, um, the idea that if only go the government had more power, more uh, scope for intrusion, it could impose more justice. Uh, you know, and I've seen this. Um, I've seen this on the part of churches, NGOs, business to some extent. Um, the the idea in this case that 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 when you talk about property, you know, there's there's a there's a guy with a top hat and uh, you know a diamond goat pin and whatever. Um, example that 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 I uh, that I like to use. In fact, I use this with um, uh, in in a discussion with representatives of the Catholic Church. It was to say that in Brazil and in China, when they hosted major sporting events, there were numerous cases of. Uh, people who had occupied particular uh, uh, particular residences, sometimes three or four generations, um, who were simply swept out of the way. Now, um, the, the, uh, the, the, the issue there is that you had a, um, you had an opportunity for, uh, for national showcasing. In China, uh, the state calls the shots in Brazil, it's a little bit different, but, you know, these people um, didn't, uh, didn't have didn't didn't have proper proper title deeds. They didn't have money, so you know if it's a if it's a if it's a you know somewhat run down apartment building, it's a bit of an eyesore anyway. You know, well, I'll fob you off with a you know with a hundred US dollars. You know, just go away so that I can put up my my um, uh, my stadium. And I said, you know, after we've got what after what we've gone through in South in, in in the past ten years in South Africa, and I was speaking in two thousand eighteen. Um. Do you, you know, who do you think is really going to be on the receiving end of this? Uh, someone like, uh, 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 like the Ruperts, like the Oppenheimers, you know, who would have, who could have CNN cameras outside their, uh, uh, their house that they, your bulldozer shows up and, you know, every high priced lawyer, uh, you know, um, are ready to attach your embassies in, 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 in distant jurisdictions or some nameless faces people who, um, you know, own a, own a few, few hectares of scrubland over which an itinerant connected businessman wants to build a golf course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's extremely, it's extremely alarming. Thanks, Terence. Um, and it brings me to my next point, which is the article that I saw of yours in News 24, I think it was this week, where you went to say that when faced with land invasions, Property owners are often pretty helpless to assert their interests. The authorities have often, time and again, shown little interest in assisting them. Now, what is the effect of insecure property rights on racial and social relations in South Africa? What are the IRR projections? Well, look, you know, it, it, 
it depends on um, it depends on the exact on the exact sort of conjunction of things. Um, you know, um, in two thousand eighteen, I think there was a uh, there was a highly publicized case of a land invasion in um, uh, in Soweto, and um, I was actually interviewed by a um, uh, by a TV news documentary crew um, about this, and the the journalist seemed to sort of struggle to get his mind around the idea that black property owners were you know pushing back against. Uh, you know uh, 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 this 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 uh, this invasion that the is is his framework seems to be well should they all black there should there should be some solidarity and I said you know it's really patronizing to think that you know your your you know your house and the, the value of your house in Parktown is somehow something to be protected but you know your house in Beepsloot isn't uh, you know let's, let's just think about a uh, 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 think about this. There's some fairly common incentives. Um, we have seen um, we have seen issues um, uh, issues that became sort of communitarian um, uh, in the south of Joburg with a large Indian community. Um, you know, you know. I think uh, I think one of the one, one of the tragedies of of of, of South Africa's history um, is that. Despite the the enormous racialized abuse, when you know the the eighties and nineties rolled around, a, a sort of semi creolized society had um, uh, had developed, and people kind of understood they had to they, they had to muddle along. Um, but you have very raw emotions that can easily be manipulated, and this is why I use the phrase political entrepreneurship. Um, you know, if only we could turn some of that into tech startups, it would be. We, um, uh, uh, we'd be great, but uh, you know we have we have political um, uh, political formations that function almost exclusively around um, around division, around anger. Um, not not all of which I'm you know I'd say you know some of it is quite is 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 quite justified in the um, uh, in a sense. The point is though it's not productive. Um, if we, you know, if we want to get from point A to point um, uh, 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 to point B, so yeah, um, I think this is this this is the kind of thing that would, I think, you know, impoverish us all, and then you know, leave you know whatever's left squabbling over the scraps and you know pointing uh, 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 pointing fingers at those who are. Who are most accessible as kind of an as an avatar of you know what what our um, uh, what our current malaise is, if you know if I can if I can just take a take a little anecdote here. I was I was told by a, um, a senior uh, a Korean diplomat once that um, uh, South Korea um, there, there, there was enormous anti-Japanese feeling after after World War II. Quite I mean they they were occupied by the Japanese, the comfort women, and all that sort of thing. He so said they, uh, but the government of the fifties had to had to decide: do we hold on to this and make this the centerpiece of our of our engagement, or do we work with a big with a big dog in town, which is the Japanese? And so we, you know, we could choose that sort of partnership, which is not always easy, or we could um, uh, we could we could continue um, uh, uh, continue our ancestral um, uh, our ancestral grievances, however justified they were, and they were. He said, ultimately, you know, South uh, South Korea now now talks to Japan as an equal, and uh, you know, South Koreans are wealth. South Korea is a wealthy, developed country. You know, we need we need to decide. We in a in a very tragic sense, but sometimes it bears being reminded of this: the heroes and villains of our past are beyond our power to praise or punish. You know, there's not much we can do about that. What we can try and do is to alter the realities that those people have have, have left for us to deal with. Thank you, Terence. And just, we are obviously coming to closing in our discussion today. Um, and I think it's good just to go back to the ANC ideology. So initially, mm -hmm. the ANC um, was formed to uh, be a liberation party. They were combating racism. They were making sure that the majority of South Africans were included in the political and economic system of the country. There was a clear beneficiary and a very clear mandate. How has that mm. differed to the ANC that we see today? What segment is going to benefit from this type of land reform policy? And I think Dave will start with you, please. Well, in fact, I think uh, a lot of it was an illusion. 
I really think that if you look at the ANC strategy and tactics documentation right throughout the process, there was always an intention to have a two-phase process. There was always an intention to have, first of all, the political transition, and then once the political transition had been achieved, to move to the economic transition. And this is, I'm afraid, very much part of the DNA of the, of the ANC. But it is a, a process that is driven by the ideology, and ideology has been the curse of our society and many other societies throughout the world. It's when you try to impose your idealistic views on reality and when you don't take into account the justifiable interests of others. That's what happened under apartheid. And that is what happens when you decide in communist societies that the workers class must predominate over everything or that race must predominate over everything in a fascist Nazi system. We've got to get back to pragmatism without boundaries. <laughs> in fact, there was a, a polemic uh, between Joel Nechitenji and Jeremy Cronin some time ago where Jeremy uh, Cronin was very upset with the pragmatic approach of Joel Nechitenzi, who was reminding uh, the SACP of the progress that had been made under Trevor Manuel and, and Taubo and Becky before 2007. And Cronin said, yes, but what you're calling for is pragmatism without boundaries. Well, that's exactly what we need. We need to get away from ideologies. We need to get back to the interests of the vast majority of ordinary South Africans who want economic growth, who want peaceful intergroup relations, who want South Africa to be a successful country. And at the moment, we're heading in the opposite direction. Terence, your my thoughts on that, well, look, I think that, that it's, it, it's important, as Dave says, to understand the DNA. Um, and I think this is, uh, this is sort of one of the, um, one of the great traps of, of, uh, of, of, of South Africa's governance, that the ANC w did not see itself as a political party. It did not see itself as one as one option among among many. Um, there's been a great deal written about this. Uh, uh, Roger Southwell, who I must say is something of an energetic critic of the institute, wrote a very good book called Liberation Movements in Southern Africa. Very, uh, um, uh, Henning Melbert uh, uh, wrote, wrote, wrote something similar about Swapo in Namibia. Um, you were dealing with a party that sees itself not as representing a constituency or representing or you know, uh, temporarily occupying government, but seeing itself as a sort of an agent of history or the most mandate of heaven. And yeah, you know that uh, that is that is not good for a uh, for a uh, for a functioning society. There, you know, have been examples where um, uh, where you know what looked like hopeless cases were able to um, were able to course correct. The example I like is gone. Um, and uh, flight lieutenant Jerry Rawlings, who had just overthrown <laughs> a government and, and you know was uh, you know going to whip everyone into shape, uh, spouting Marxism until he actually looked at the books and he just said, "We can't, we can't go on like this." And he became you know quite an, um, uh, uh, quite, an, quite quite an aggressive, pragmatic reformer. And understand after he left power, he travelled around Africa teaching people teamwork. You know, go to like beaches and say, "Let's pull that boat and get everyone." So uh, yeah, you know. Um, the, these things, these things can be um, uh, uh, can be turned around, and you know, Dave, Dave said a great deal about you know uh, two two stages: the first transition, the second transition. The one transition that I think we have missed is the ANC has not made that transition to a, you know to a modern um, uh, party, you know, which you know probably be some uh, uh, somewhere left of center but able to see itself as 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 part of a constellation of others um in in open um uh in open competition i think the good news though is that the mystique that it had because it wasn't just the ANC that believed this about itself a lot of uh, other good-hearted people seem to have to accept the logic that it was the country's natural I think that if there's one positive thing that has come out of the disastrous decade we had, 
it's that that patina of invincibility and uh, uh, moral rectitude is no longer is no longer a viable prospect. And you know that I think ultimately ultimately is for the is for the good of the country. Well, thank you, Terence. Thank you so much for joining us today for this important discussion. And thank you, Dave, for also being with us today. Thank you to our audience for joining us for this episode of the Constitution at Work. Remember to like, subscribe, and turn on post notifications to be alerted when our next video is up. If you have any feedback on today's episode, please feel free to have your say in the comments section. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter at FW De Clark Foundation to keep up with our latest news. We look forward to checking in again soon. Bye.